There are two major conflicts destined to occur within the Cyberpunk series that will likely come to fruition in Cyberpunk Orion. A fifth corporate war will sprout, and in the fog of war, the AI beyond the Black Wall will enact the plan we've been forming. A full-scale AI invasion. You heard me right, the sequel Cyberpunk Orion will take place during both a fifth corporate war and an AI invasion. Despite this being early speculation, I have a large catalog of evidence to provide throughout this video toward these two ideas. So hear me out. If you happen to be a fan of cyberpunk lore and theories, think about glancing at my other content and subscribing. There's a lot to learn about within this vast series that dates back to its original sourcebook in 1988. Let's begin. You might be questioning where I'd even begin to speculate on an installment that we've only been provided a name of. Even then, it's a placeholder name, so in reality we don't even know the final title. I believe we can make use of Orion though. Just to cover as much ground as possible, I do want to state that there is only one relation I can find in the source books to the name Orion. This would be a group found in Cyberpunk 2020, the Orion Corporation. It's based in the USA and specializes in special ops missions and search slash rescue situations. Though from my personal review over this corporation and its history, it's doubtful it holds a significant impact within 2077 and beyond, seeing as their last mention was in 2020. Ignoring this obscure connection though, there are two key takeaways from this title. The name Orion originates from Greek mythology and of course is the inspiration behind the naming of the Orion constellation, okay? Who cares about some stars in the sky? We're here for cyberpunk. Well yes, we are, and if we begin to piece together some events and evidence, we can realize the importance of a game being named after a constellation. It makes a foundational connection between Cyberpunk sequel and outer space. The reasoning behind this holding importance goes beyond something like the Crystal Palace or Moon Exploration, although we all know it would be extremely cool to explore these locations. The next corporate war is likely to sprout as a result of conflict over dominance in outer space, among other possibilities. We've seen this conflict slowly grow and really approach a breaking point in 2077. For those of us who have missed this portion of 2077 or need a refresher, there's a space group titled the European Space Agency, or ESA for short. It's the world's largest and most advanced spacefaring organization. They control the lion's share of all space-related activity. There's been a lot of stress and conflict over the ESA's power and orbit, and there's a relatively long history to the ESA, but it's not necessary to completely cover it in this video, though I may come back to it at a later time. You just need to understand that the ESA has an unrivaled presence in outer space that a lot of corporations envy. In 2077 though, a Militech operatives team discovered that the Arasaka Corporation had been hiding the fact that they had a mass driver on the moon. The ESA maintained that it was the only organization allowed to operate and own mass drivers, an edge they wanted to keep. The ESA called an immediate meeting to re-examine Arasaka's license in space affairs. A senior Arasaka counterintelligence operative in Night City ordered a cyber attack against the ESA during the voting session over whether to revoke Arasaka's license to bases in the Sea of Clouds on Luna. We actually can review a live recording of this meeting alongside even concept art. This meeting ends with the deaths of several council members, resulting in a delay on the vote. Have a seat, Pete. Be right with you. We have to handle this voting issue before we lose our bases in the Sea of Clouds. They're about to begin. What's the situation? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just as we thought. You know what to do. Start now. A clear net positive for Arasaka, and another success in its use of Soul Killer as an assassination tool. Now, this was a pretty bold move to be pushed by Arasaka. It's clear as day who the perpetrators of this attack were, and would only possibly lead to dangerous tension between the two sides. ESA clearly has Militech and even the Soviet Union as its allies already two extremely strong allies that would be forced up against Arasaka in its own. It's no secret that Militech wants war with Arasaka, and nothing more than to completely obliterate the mega corporation from existence. 
Besides this stunt they pulled with the ESA, there's an obvious history between the two that primarily sprouts from the fourth corporate war. But there's a war that happened shortly before 2077 that makes it abundantly obvious that a major war is soon to come, the Unification War. This was a conflict between the new United States and the Free States that occurred during 2069 and 2070. While this might sound like a war between governments on the surface, it can be quite deceiving. It is much more accurate to categorize this as a quasi-corporate war, seeing as just like the preceding Fourth Corporate War, the participation of Militech and Arasaka was essential. The war was finally concluded by a ceasefire signed in Arvin, SoCal. However, both sides declared victory for themselves and found the terms of peace largely unsatisfactory causing many to believe the outbreak of another armed conflict was only a matter of time. The Free States were obliged to forfeit their independent status, albeit only on paper, as they would remain autonomous in practice. Ultimately, the Noosa chose to accept the conditions of this peaceful resolution rather than risk escalation of the war across the globe, resulting in potentially millions of casualties and, more importantly, a deep recession. This unsatisfying conclusion for all parties allows us to understand the already existing tension between Militech and Arasaka is not an old wound from the 2020s. It's fresh, only likely to get worse going forward. We can begin to piece this together as we look at the Phantom Liberty DLC. With collaboration between Militech and Nusa, there is clearly an ongoing power creep into Night City. Of course, we won't know the full details until its eventual release but we do know that the outcome may not be so pretty. I covered this topic in a previous video as well. It is currently a possibility that Phantom Liberty provides Militech and Noosa an opportunity to strike Arasaka with V in a new ending. It's an interesting possibility provided the outcome leading to an immediate corporate war. I suggest checking out the video when you get the chance. I will have it linked down below. So, we've set up the groundwork for the inevitable fifth corporate war destined to bloom in the near future. This, however, isn't even the true threat the cyberpunk universe faces. A corporate war is just that, a war, one of many that have occurred throughout history at the price of those under the control of greedy corps. The much larger threat is yet to come, yet to show its card and has never been faced previously. The fifth corporate war will pale in comparison to the AI invasion that is bound to occur in its smokescreen. To completely understand where I am coming from, we first need to establish an understanding of Alt Cunningham, Raish Barmas, Soul Killer, and the Data Crash. Considered the most brilliant hacker in the net, Raish Barmas was a rogue netrunner who went out of his way to harass and undermine the corporations, which he viewed as ultimate oppressors of humanity. As a result, he lived most of his life on the run with corporate bounties on his head and resorted to hiding in a disguised chirogenic freezer with life support tech and net access that he spent his final days in. Bartmoss created the rabid slash data crash virus as a grand act of defiance against corporate control to be triggered in the event of his death. It was designed to breach all corporate data fortresses and unleash their data on a vignette for all to access but it ended up having a very different effect. When the virus was released, it infected 78.2% of the net in a matter of months. Net traffic came to a grinding halt. Corporations lost billions as the stock market destabilized. Huge amounts of data were corrupted, and countless military-grade artificial intelligence were unshackled and mutated into extremely dangerous entities. The nature of a data crash even allowed soul-killed pseudo-intellects to travel through what remained of the net unimpeded, possibly a favor from Bart Moss to his old friend and fellow programmer, Al Cunningham. Netwatch, unable to reverse the damage or neutralize the AIs, decided to create the Black Wall, with the sole task of blocking off sections of the net that had been overrun by rogue AIs with ice, so that the rest of the net could be salvaged. It is revealed by various sources, though, that the Black Wall is not a firewall actually a powerful AI masquerading as ICE, whose job is to keep out any rogue AIs it can identify from the secure net. The Black Wall. What is it exactly? I mean, I know... You know only what the Netwatch tell you. The final bastion against the post-war AIs. The great victory of humanity over chaos. 
That would be your Saturday morning Netwatch propaganda. But the Black Wall is an AI itself. The boundary condition let no thing pass through, either way. If the AIs thought like people, they would call it a traitor. It's also referred to as a band-aid solution, due to the fact that the Black Wall, being an AI, could go rogue itself. So now we are left with a massive portion of the net rendered unusable with the supposed big friendly AI blocking entire armies of dangerous AI out. The reliability and the alliance of the Black Wall is rather easily called into question, as we already have a shocking amount of evidence and examples provided to us that prove rogue AI have already gotten out of the old net. Now whether this is through a breach or being let through, we can't be entirely sure, but nonetheless, it's unsettling. Looking past the fact that all Cunningham got through with ease, the first of these examples come from the resonant AI and taxi boy of 2077, Delamain. Most of us will remember the quest Don't Lose Your Mind, in which Delamain is infected by a virus and split into multiple rogue AI personalities. Within this quest, Delamain himself confirms he's from beyond the Black Wall if you do the Voodoo Boys questline before going to the HQ. Normally, he would just refer to himself as somewhat of an immigrant, but if you do that questline beforehand, V will respond from beyond the black wall, and Delamain will say, beyond indeed. So yes, a taxi cab AI is from beyond the black wall, and honestly makes this war sound like a walk in the park. This is unfortunately not the case. The true mystery of this AI invasion lies in the plains of Night Corp and the blue-eyed people. Night Corp is a very unique corporation as it puts its full attention on Night City and its affairs. The company is the largest contractor of public procurements within the boundaries of the city, building and renovating facilities such as roads, bridges, tunnels, metro lines, power plants, and so on. Night Corp is also known for the charities designed to aid the poor children of Night City in scholarship programs to benefit gifted youth. Jefferson Perales was among them. In 2077, we learned through a Night Corp employee and Netrunner by the name Sandra Dorset that Night Corp had conducted testing using an AI to condition its own employees. The AI was designed to control not just their workers, but other figures Night Corp deemed useful to them. Listen to this shard detail in the operation. The tests have come back successful. The artificial intelligence CN07 has proven itself capable of bypassing commercial, device-specific, and macro security systems accessible to Night Corp employees of the lowest ranks. None of the test subjects were aware that this experiment was being conducted on them. In compliance with the orders that was given, CN07 focused mostly on subject HK13, which at the time of the experiment's commencement was classified as calm and empathetic. After a period of subliminal conditioning, as we predicted, HK-13 began to display acute psychopathic behavior. The highlight was a dispute over coffee, during which HK-13 strangled one of their colleagues, then jumped out of the 16th floor window of the research facility. We will soon commence the next phase of the procedure and install CN-07 onto the devices of our actual target. Does this all sound familiar? Well, you wouldn't be blamed for thinking of the Perales questline in which V discovers that Mayor Candidate Jefferson Perales has been being brainwashed by his hired security firm, all of it tied in of a shadowy organization seemingly helmed by an even more mysterious figure, Mr. Blue Eyes. Near the end of the questline, V will receive a direct hollow warning from an unknown caller, stating that no matter what V tells to Jefferson, nothing will change, and also warning them not to keep meddling in their affairs. The unknown caller will make it clear that they know about V's true nature and goals, referring to the Ingram problem. Mr. Blue Eyes will be present just across the meeting spot, on the terrace of a building, watching over the exchange. This questline would be the only time we visually see and hear from Mr. Blue Eyes besides the Crystal Palace ending. Though, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is all we know about him. Johnny Silverhand can comment that he believes this was all the work of rogue AIs with an inscrutable goal, which doesn't seem to be so far off from the truth. Seeing as blue eyes commonly is used to display a data transfer, with a constant glow we can infer that there is a constant exchange of data, meaning that it is extremely likely an AI is being broadcasted into the body of Mr. Blue Eyes. The lore in the original cyberpunk TTRPG 
Eamon talks about urban legends of blue-eyed people who are rogue AIs that have taken control of human bodies and are secretly manipulating the highest levels of politics and finance. A blue-eyed man behind a plot to control a political candidate and likely a part of the mysterious Night Corp happens to tick these boxes pretty well. We can even take this concept a step further when we look into Gary the Prophet. Gary can be seen throughout the campaign spreading various theories. Gary even mentions how blue-eyed people live in space and come down to Earth to control politicians. A clear connection being drawn of urban legends of Red, the Net, and the manipulation of Jefferson. While spouting a theory that nomads are actually werewolves, Gary inadvertently offends two members of the Alicados, forcing V to step in and rescue him. With his life saved, Gary tells V that one of his implants allow him to listen to communication channels, which he believes to be aliens. He guides them to what he believes to be a meeting site for the Lizardmen, though this turns out to be a meeting between Maelstrom, members, and two unidentified corpos. The importance of Maelstrom needs to be pointed out, as they are both a tech and rogue AI obsessed gang, if their disturbing cybernetics didn't make it obvious to you. V is able to recover a data chip from this meeting that when decrypted presents us with an unknown plan that is set to be executed, which only goes by the name Project Oracle. Further analysis in this name though, an oracle by definition is a person through whom a god is believed to speak, furthering the idea that rogue AI are controlling humans and acting through them. When V returns from the meeting, they learn from one of Gary's supporters that he's been abducted by black suited people with blue eyes who took him into an AV and flew away to their quote unquote mothership. Gary's friend tried asking for help from the NCPD, but the officers simply claimed Gary was sick and let him be taken away. It's unknown who these individuals were, but they were described by Gary's friend, Sue Glover, to be dressed as corporates and have blue eyes. Afterward, we can even find a niche in the columbarium dedicated to him. He knew too much, so they dealt with him. There is a clear connection to be drawn between these different quest lines. Gary the Prophet, Paralys, Dandra Dorset, Night Corp, and Mr. Blue Eyes are all connected. Jefferson Paralys, Gary the Prophet, and Mr. Blue Eyes even wear the same ring on their finger, except Mr. Blue Eyes is gold. The ultimate plan behind it all clearly being Project Oracle. I propose to you after all this information, my theory on Project Oracle. I believe the Oracle is in reference to the Mikoshi merge with Alt. During our time in Mikoshi, we can understand that Alt plans to merge with all of the engrams contained within Mikoshi, alongside V or Silverhand. There's a clear purpose behind this that we never really end up questioning throughout our interaction with Alt. Silverhand really just writes it off, though I'd say this could in technicality be the second phase of the data crash that perhaps Spartmoss had always planned for the creation of an ultimate hive mind, and therefore, a reality in which the net and the physical world merge together. Yielding complete control over both domains is a possibility that we see even Barmas return. While this is all the speculation and information I can provide, I can assure every single one of you there's more to uncover. I believe all of this connects back to Cyberpunk's largest mystery, FF06B5. Now I'm a lore and theory guy. I've never been much of a genius when it comes to these styles of code. One day we, the community, will figure out the mystery and solve what will inevitably take place in the upcoming Orion sequel. I will continue to keep you all updated as best as possible when it comes to Cyberpunk's vast lore. I hope you all enjoyed the video. I ended up diving into specifics a lot more than I expected. Originally what I thought to be a 10 minute video turned into something more. Let me know your thoughts down below and if you agree with my speculation on the upcoming plot of Orion. If you'd like to keep up to date on Cyberpunk's lore and updates, subscribe to my channel and check out my other content. If you'd like to go a step further, I now have channel memberships open for as little as $1 a month. You can get some perks such as profile icons, emoticons, and a unique title. I stream every Sunday at 11 a.m. PST. I have a Discord for all viewers, so I'd love to talk to you all there as well. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, Chooms.